my way or something. I, <laughs> You know, once you're a minister, how can you not stop talking? <laughs> so anyway, oops, so I can see here. I'm here from Reverend Maggie, and she's with Joe Vispanza, Vispanza, and they're learning all these wonderful things. And she told me that the theme for this month is home. And since this is the Center for Spiritual Living, I thought, well, why not talk about our spiritual home? I mean, we, we have a physical home, and I know you know all about that, but what about your spiritual mental home? The one where you have all these emotions, all these feelings. How do you get back to center once you've gotten lost? and all these emotions. I know if you're physically lost, you just get on your phone and ask Siri and she sends you home. <laughs> but if you're lost physically, I'm um, spiritually, we need some, some kind of a compass to get us home. And I found mine in religious science, and of course religious science is the root of this Center for Spiritual Living. If there's confusion, here's somebody here for the first day? So everybody's got some knowledge. So, a little bit about Ernest, who wrote what I'm going to talk about today, the, what we believe. Uh, his brother, uh, and Frederick, is that right? He yeah. talked about Ernest and the fact that in their, at home, there was a lot to do and centered around the Bible, and that got him started. And so he was searching his whole life from every source he could find for this spiritual understanding. And it happens when he was young in the early 30s, 40s, that uh, Christian science was where people went to get healed because the medical profession wasn't much of anything. You know, they just had a few things. And so they would go there. So he became a, a Christian science Practitioner, I don't know if you knew that. And he and Joe Goldsmith opened an office where they were going to do practitioner work for their living. And I it went along for a little while, and then Ernest went to work for the for the purchasing agent as a purchasing agent for the city of Los Angeles. And of course, he'd take his books to work, and people come in there and they'd look at his desk and hear these books, and they want to know what's all that. And he started telling a few people. And all of a sudden, somebody said, why don't you come to my place and talk to my friends? And I guess he thought, I don't know, maybe. So he went. And the next thing he did, he was asked to go speak to a whole bunch of people. And then he was asked to speak to 100 people. And when it got 1,000 people, they decided maybe we should organize it. So that was the beginning of Science of Mind. And then for, for tax reasons, it, it became a... Uh, religious science. So everybody in life, so he brought, so uh, his brother said, he said, somebody asked him about what he believed, and it's Frederick, 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 he said that Ernest sat down and in a very few moments wrote what I believe. And it was 16 pretty powerful statements. And then it became public and everybody in religious science thought, wow, I want that for what I believe. And so it became what we believe. So what I want to talk about today is the Science of Mind Declaration of Principles. And the first one is, and you, I, no, I, I gave you that on this kind of a skin of a brown sheet. And I also, as a minister, I kept, people kept asking me if we as Christians, and I, I don't know what's a Christian. So I, this white sheet is a it's the best I can find for what Christians believe, and I just thought you might want to compare it to what we have upgraded to in religious science. 
And we believe in God, the living spirit almighty, the one absolute, uh, indestructible, self-existent cause. And as you know, there are many choices about our beginning. I mean, in our, in our ancient text, God was the beginning, and then Darwin kind of had his beginning, and then we came up with the with uh, the Big Bang, and then later on, after we got a lot of technology, science started realizing that none of this works unless we have an intelligent origin. So my feeling is that God kind of encompasses everything or the, the, the intelligent origin also covers it all. So I felt very comfortable about that. The second one was, we believe this one manifests itself in through and has all creation, but it's not absorbed by its creation. Meaning, God is all there is. It's everywhere. It's in each one of us. There's nothing that can be unless it's a part of God. So when you're disturbed and lost, you know that you have God at your back because he's got his skin in your game. And not only has he got his skin in your name, he's got a portion of his consciousness in your name because you're an individual expression of his consciousness and also you're playing in his field making things. So I sometimes when I get lost, I like to think about this because it begins to center me back that, oh man, everything that we know about God and its power is also in me, and when I learn to use it, then I can get out of any mess I get in. And the third one is, we believe that the manifest universe is the body of God, is a logical and necessary outcome of the infinite self-knowingness of God. This, is, this process has been going on in and through us, and you've probably heard the jingle, in me, is me, as me, once again, God is, in, is everywhere. Not only is it out there, but it's also in here. We believe in the incarnation of spirit, incarnation of spirit, in everyone and all people are incarnations of that one spirit. The implication is, and the fact is, we each are an individual expression of the same one spirit. I keep saying this because Sometimes I keep hearing that God's there and God's over there. They, I want us to get that it's really in here. We each are in an individual spirit, learning our individual self-knowingness of God and ourselves. Science supports this, and you've heard a little bit of talk about it, and the experiences in entanglement show that if anything was ever once connected, no matter what you do to one part of it, when you separate it, it also happens to the other part of it at the same time. So if we're all one, then we're all connected, and we all affect each other. And boy, would the world change the minute we realize that. The fact is that when this, that this is not a belief, it's a really knowing. Knowing that you are part of this infinite oneness. And actually, I feel this was the secret of Jesus. He believed in his oneness with God unconditionally. He knew that when he spoke his words, that immediately it manifested that thought. So if you're looking for nuggets, you can begin to realize that there's a lot of nuggets in what we believe. And when you get lost, if you go through those nuggets, you'll find the one that you need to uh, start believing in again. Number five is we believe in the eternity eternity and the immortality and the continuity of the individual soul forever and ever expanding. 
Now this is our physical life, and sometimes we just focus on that, but really, our, it's only a part of our immortal life, real life. Now, that kind of, I know when my mother passed away, I was there telling her, don't worry, if you're, this body's worn out, you're tired of it, it's going to be wonderful when you get on the other side. And I believe that, and I know she's over there, and she's having a great time. And this was a gift, and this is the gift of Ernest Holmes. It is our second home, and our real home. And our, it's our conscious home, our spiritual home, and where we can learn, and when we learn to visit that, we can bring back the joys and the wonder of that consciousness and the world in our consciousness and bring it back and use it in our physical world. We believe the ultimate goal of life would be a complete emancipation from all discord of every nature. And that goal is sure to be attained by all. Okay, so we're creative beings. And sometimes in this creative process, things don't go right. They just don't work out as planned. Well, this is learning wisdom. And we just try again till we get it right. It's not a sin to do something and have it not work. In fact, one of our teachers, uh, Dr. Holland, used to, he taught at our, our ministerial school and he told us about all these different things. And he said, oh, don't worry about sin, it's not real, it's an archery term. And it's a term they, uh, they used when they did the translation for the King James Version of the Bible. And what it means is that when you shot your arrow, it fell short of the target. So, raise your sights and shoot again. So, these things that we do that don't go right, don't worry about it. Try to work it out as you really planned it and know that we just keep doing it again until we get it right. And we've got all the time in the world to do that. Okay, and number eight is we believe in the unity of all life and the highest God and the innermost God. And this is really just the review of the first four about God itself. But it's interesting to know that God is this creative being, which is, when, if you use the omni word, it's a, um, omnipotent. And of course, it's the other ones. Only present, only science, only whatever. We believe, number nine, we believe God is personal to all those who feel the indwelling presence. We have to be quiet in our minds, and we have to quiet our minds in our conscious brain wave state to beta, and this is what Joe Dispenza word. You have to go from a beta state to an alpha state, and when you do that, you need to take the sympathetic nervous system and run it over into the parasympathetic so that you're quiet and you're in that state where you can really listen and hear that little voice inside. Now, a lot of these things, I mean, this could be a week long or a month long or whoever knows how long, seminar. So I'm skipping over this pretty fast. We believe in the direct, and number 10, we believe in the direct revelation of truth through the intuitive and spiritual nature of the individual. And that any person may become a revealer of truth who believes in his close contact with the indwelling God. Now, I don't know about you, but for me to find the real truth these days is kind of difficult because of all the information that's flowing around. And I kind of told Reverend Mankey one day that I had a boss who said, you know, every one of these books has a nugget in it, but you, you have to read carefully sometimes to find it. 
So, how do we find this information from our from our close contact with our indwelling God? Because this process, when we learn to do that, allows us to find the real truth from within ourselves and from the one source. And this is the source of all of our sacred readings. You'll know Ernest was connected to this universal spirit. And you, you know when you pick up a book, whether or not it's something new and something true, or whether it's formed over something obvious. So it's up to us to get this connection, because when we do, life blooms, and you have everything you need. You like Jesus. You'll know that when you speak your word, it just goes poof. There it is. I'm always so amazed by him, because he, he walked around those early days in a white robe, and it was seamless, which was the ultimate of clothes. And he didn't have, there was no, no but they didn't have a provisional trail behind him of donkeys and camels and food and stuff on it, all provisioned. He just went wherever he went, wherever he went. If he needed something, he just went, oh, 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 oh. We can do that, but it takes a lot of internal learning. We believe the universe the universe, oh, this is number 11. We believe that the universal spirit, which is God, operates through a universal mind, which is the law of God, and that we are surrounded by this creative mind, which seizes the direct impress of our thought and acts upon it. It doesn't say some thoughts, it just all thought. Now, in science, somebody talked about what religious science is, which is Ask him what religious science was, and he says, Well, it's a correlation of the laws of science, opinion, philosophy, revelation, religion. And in science, when you go to do the correlation, science with a new technology, science with the proton slot experiments, has demonstrated that all thought is created. Thought changes the universe of possibility, as you've heard the field out there full of possibility. It allows you to bring, to take those photons and make that waveform collapse into a particle, into whatever it is that you need, whether it's moving people around, fixing your body of some ailment or whatever. That's kind of what happens. We're learning more and more about thought. It is a interesting in the endless process when you start thinking about how does thought work. So your positive thoughts bless the subject and your negative thoughts cause problems to that project. So to the wise person, with loving thoughts always to your partner, good relationship. With negative thoughts to your partner, negative no partner. I think this works in marriage really well because I see it come apart and people start not liking each other. Number 12, we believe in the healing of the sick through the power of this mind. And number 13, we believe in the control of conditions through the power of this mind. Now, I'm kind of a little out of the box here, but I think that these two specialized type prayers are to get us off of some false belief we have that is manifesting itself in our relationships or our bodies to fix those so we can get on with being an infinite creator and part of creating the universe with everybody else. So there's an end to those, but there's something more. Ernest says that anything Anything that the mind thinks, it cannot think. So there's that.
there's that you can always think of. I mean, it's our salvation, I guess, to think of something that's causing a problem. Recognize it and begin to think of you know, something different. We believe in the eternal goodness and the, and the eternal loving kindness and the eternal givingness of life to all. And this is kind of the same thing as the number nine. But I'd like to do a personal experience here. In about three weeks, I'm going to Israel with Greg Brady. And about 20 years ago, I guess it was nine, yeah, 20 years ago, I went with Greg to Egypt. And we were to fly into Cairo. And then we we're going to go through the Great Pyramid. And then we we're going to go on up to the Nile and a bunch of stuff. Well, about five days before we had to catch the plane to fly to Cairo, I'm in bed. And I am just in the most panic state I've ever been in. Totally in involved in sweat, the whole bed was wet, I was wet, I was hot. And I was thinking, I'm claustrophobic. That big pyramid's got that thing that goes down about a hundred yards. And it's this wide and about this high. I just can't do it. I cannot do it. Finally I said, God, I just can't do it. Voice went on my head, in my head. But I'll be with you. Poof! <laughs> it all went away. And when I got to Cairo, I went over and kissed the pyramid and made friends. And that night, clear to the bottom. I, you know, night, I mean, light has never been that bad. But it's that, see, the oneness, the, the personalness of this presence is unbelievable. It is so loving, so giving. Uh, I think Jesus tried to explain that when he was, he was in a group around a fire or something and he was talking to his disciples and they were all asking him, where do you get this power? How can we do this? And Jesus was looking at him and he was thinking, how am I going to make this? How am I going to make him understand? You know what? 2,000 years ago, 2,200 years ago, how do you know what people thought? Or how they thought? And finally he says, well, it's the Father within me that doeth the work. Meaning, in those days, they knew that if the Father was a good Father, was a prosperous Father, that the family flourished. And that it was a lovingness of that Father that made everything work. And he was making that connection to the presence as being the father of us. The one, I mean, the oneness, the connectedness, the loving part of them. So we believe, number 15, we believe in our own soul, our own spirit, and our own destiny. We are all different. It's not for any one of us to be like anybody else. said that being good can cause you more problems than you can imagine. Because by being good, you're not being yourself. You're being what you thought everybody else wanted you to do so you would be good. And as an individual, you need to be doing your own thing. So, as we remember our unique oneness of soul and individualization of the one spirit, we remember we are contributors to the all of life. Our universe is participatory. Have you heard that? We each are contributing to its continuous creation. And number 16, the last. For we understand that the life we live is God. And I think this is Ernest Holmes' gift to us about our spiritual side. 
in our home in, that we go to, which is our real home, our spiritual home. And Jesus gave us permission to know our spiritual heritage and to make it easier for us to understand our thoughts and their consequences and their contribution to the growth of our universal wisdom. So I thank you. And I love you all. <laughs> and have a great day. Okay, I'm going to do it different. Okay. I want you to do a treatment for me, but I want you to decide what you want to treat for. Now, there's some things about treatment that we know. We, have, we need to know that God is the foundation of our faith. You know, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not, things not seen. Well, we want to put that our faith in that knowingness that God will answer every question, every prayer. He knows our need even before we ask. So, start thinking about what it is that you would like, that you need. And then take your imagination and make it bigger. Make it bigger. And as Greg told us when he was there with those monks, when he used to be able to go into Tibet, they would be doing all this stuff. And Greg asked him, I see what you're doing. What are you feeling? What are you doing inside? And he says, all that stuff is to create, help us create the feeling that the prayer we're doing is true. So begin to create a feeling and emotion about what it would be like to have that particular prayer answer right here, right now. And so, bear with me for a moment as we begin, recognizing that there's just this one infinite spirit, if we want to call it that, God, if we want to call it that, whatever you want to call it that, the, if you want to be one of intelligent source, and know that everything is that, even us. And that it's all in a harmonious order. That's how the universe works. And that universe works through us in harmony. And right now, we would like this as the harmony of our existence. And we see it. And we feel it. And we know it. And we realize the picture what it is we want. And with gratitude and thanksgiving and those feelings of love and joy, let us know that what it is that you want is present right here, right now. And so